my goodness, can the Pro Bowl be any worse of a product to view? I mean, I don't know about you. I maybe watched a handful of plays from that game, and I and I turned away. I was like, I can't even. It's unwatchable, in my opinion. I mean, Terrible. I've seen some bad products. Hotel Transylvania 4, <laughs> this latest one, not good. <laughs> Doesn't even have Adam Sandler in it. It is not quality. Oh, man. Uh, don't even buy a pee. It's not worth your peacock time. Uh, I've seen, I just, this weekend, uh, my fiance and I binged the woman in the house across the street from the girl in the window. Yeah, not well, great. did you watch the girl in the window? I did. The movie I thought okay. was fine. I actually, I could not believe that she got nominated for a Razzie for like bad performance. I thought, I thought Amy Adams was terrific. I actually thought the girl in the window was quite enjoyable now i didn't see either one so i i, we I have no thoughts but uh, there was a deal it was a, a battling a hangover all day but maybe that influenced it but yeah i've seen some bad product recently uh, i did not actually uh commit real time to the pro bowl watch a little bit and then as soon as i realized they weren't it was you know not even gonna try yeah it's not it's not worth it um i will just say this at this point in time i think most nfl fans agree um, and we've said on the show before, all pro is meaningful. It's the, it is the thing that should be taken for the most all pro second team and third team, all pro should be the things you really gauge who had great seasons on. I do think though, in a way to make sure you avoid all the alternates and all these other guys getting pro bowls and adding to their pro bowl stats, stuff like that, that doesn't really matter. I, I really do think it should just be an, like an honors banquet type of thing. If you want to, you know, fan vote the Pro Bowl and then let them do their fun skills things, because it's obvious, and I don't blame any of these guys. No one wants to get hurt during the game. Like, it is so obvious, and I don't blame them for it. So just do a, do the skill stuff, have the fun stuff, do the televised things. Um, watch Kirk Cousins miss a bunch of targets. I'm all for that. That is That is quality entertainment. And then just do a big dinner and have some fun, sign autographs, do a big thing, and then try not to uh, assault anyone on the way home. You know what I mean? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, let's try not to pull a, a New Orleans Saints running back uh, after the game. I mean, I sure. hate That's... to make light of it, but good God. I mean, I, know, I mean Talk about yeah. Vegas, like everyone talking about Vegas. It's going to be great for the Pro Bowl, and it all makes sense. And, you know, guys can let loose, have some fun. It'll in incentivize people going. And uh, this is what you get, though. Apparently, some guys can't handle it. And obviously, we don't know all the details. Yeah, yet, I mean, there's nightclubs everywhere, though. Yeah. It, Alvin well, Kamara probably would have gone to a nightclub. Less in Orlando, I would imagine. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you're absolutely – I mean, it, it, all joking aside, it, it's, it's, it's a scary situation. And – uh you know, and I, I know we don't have all the details, but not a great way to end a bad weekend for the NFL. You know what I mean? And what's setting up Definitely to be a not. great weekend, this Super Bowl 56, we, we both agree. I think it's gonna be a great watch, fun game, a lot of great storylines this weekend with no football. It really was no football. And then you have the Alvin Kamara storyline. Yeah, that's a bad look for the Saints, bad look for him, bad look for the weekend in general. Uh, we'll see when more info comes out, but yeah, certainly not trending in the right direction there. Uh, also, uh, the new it, Ice Age, but... like Buck Wild thing on Disney Plus, also a bad watch. What they Don't... came out with another Ice Age? Well, Disney owns all the 20th Century Fox stuff now, so they're sure. doing like Disney Plus exclusive release. With uh, again, you know, oh, that's, not, that's not Queen Latifah. That's not her in the, in the movie, and it's not good. Don't uh. watch. Another bad product. John Leguizamo is not in it. It's not. It's not quality. I'm well, it's, you know, is it a good movie when John Leguizamo is not in it? Period. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, Kanto, I've never seen it. And, and Kanto's doing great. He, yeah. He, we don't yeah. talk about Bruno. I didn't realize he was Bruno at first. Then, yep. On rewatch number eight, I realized that's John Leguizamo. There you go. There you go. The man of uh, many talents, right there. He was it, Luigi. originated as Luigi, right? Nice. So, gotta <laughs> love it. That's where he got his big break. Toulouse. Moulin What's that? Toulouse. Oh, yeah. yeah. Moulin yeah. Shout out Nate Byrne. Fair point. Fair point. The quarter zone will marry the Maharaja. 
Well, we've got obviously a lot to uh, look forward to on this episode, Mark, our Super Bowl preview, of course. Um, And that will come at the end of the episode. We're going to build towards that. I have a lot of uh, uh, interesting stuff to throw Mark's way. He's got some some comments as well. We've got Super Bowl facts. We've got uh, Super Bowl game specific facts. We've got prop bets. And then, of course, the game itself to pour over. So. Uh, before we get into all of that on our Super Bowl preview episode here on the Football Lounge, let's quickly uh, talk about some news items that came down uh, over the past week, Mark, and that is that uh, two new head coaches have been hired, that being the Miami Dolphins yesterday on Sunday, uh, hiring uh, Mike McDaniel, the offensive coordinator for the San Francisco 49ers, as their next head coach, a 38-year-old, becomes the first minority candidate to be selected in this hiring cycle so far. And then the second uh, came when Lovey Smith was just announced earlier today on Monday yeah. as the next head coach of the Houston Texans. So Lovey Smith, after a decade absence of being a head coach in the NFL, returns to that role in Houston. I like the hire. I think it's uh, you know good for him. I thought he deserved to get another shot as a head coach in the NFL at some point. And, uh, you know, he's been in the building. He was the assistant head coach last year or associate head coach, I should say, and um, he gets his next chance there. So your thoughts on those two hires initially? Well, yeah, I'll start with Lovey uh, in Houston. I mean, you know how much I've ripped Houston's organization. I still think fundamentally they are so flawed in their in their leadership from ownership to management. Uh, and, 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 you know, we don't need to rehash all of my, you know, my thoughts on, uh, on the, the people who are leading the Houston Texans. But I do think, you know, this this is the type of move that it just seems as though the Texans realize they're a black eye on the NFL right now. Not a lot of great candidates want the job. David Culley getting the job last year was a weird hire always from the beginning just because he had no head coaching experience. He, he just seemed like one of those guys that was destined and perfectly fit to be a lifer at the assistant level. A coordinator level and and really good at that level and and that's where he should be the fact that they brought in a guy like a lovey smith to be an associate head coach throughout the season just tells you they didn't necessarily believe in the hire anyways and that's not david cully's fault we didn't blame david cully when he got hired saying if you get an opportunity you better take it and and he overall we both were blown away about how over uh, over expectations, uh, the overperformed expectations in Houston. I- I'm happy for Lovey. I've always been a Lovey guy. I thought Lovey got such a raw deal in Tampa, his short stint there, and I thought that Lovey never made sense in the collegiate level. It just didn't fit at all, and uh, and uh, and so I'm I'm happy for him. I I think Lovey will get a couple years here to just try to build credibility back to the franchise. I think exactly. if Lovey gets. Yeah. Lovey Smith can keep them relevant, can keep them out of the cellar, um, can help them help guide them through this Deshaun Watson transition uh, and and what that looks like and not being a dumpster fire of a one in, you know, 16 team, a two and 15 type of team. I think he can help uh, do that. And, and, uh, and, and so in that sense, I think it's a really good hire. You know, he can be a, he can get you to a, a stability. He can build your defense. Uh, he'll, they'll have an identity and, uh, and if you can keep them, oh, you know, just flirting with 500 over the next couple of years until you figure out, all right, where's our quarterback situation? What is our, what does our future look like? I think it's, I think it's a really solid hire and, and, and he's a player's coach. Players will like to play for him. He's going to be well endorsed in that way. And so it, it helps Houston um, become more football serious. It didn't seem football serious at this time last year, this does seem a little bit more football serious, winning game oriented, uh, being serious to committing on the field. Now, the Miami Dolphins, I'll let you lead off on it and your thoughts on 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 on, on uh, Lovey as well. Uh, Dolphins, it's to me, it's a little bit of a surprising hire. Yeah, I mean, I I wasn't expecting it, and Mike McDaniel is a guy that really, I mean, I didn't know who he was at all prior to maybe like three months ago. Then all of a sudden, yeah. all those uh, videos of him talking at uh, conferences and things like that about his, you know, uh, football savvy. People were really fawning over the guy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's interesting. He was, he is now 
Uh, yet again, another member of that, I believe it was 2012 Washington staff yeah, with coach. Matt LaFleur, Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan, Mike McDaniel. Obviously, McDaniel followed Shanahan to the staff at San Fran when he got hired. And, uh, he followed so, him to Atlanta and then to San Or Atlanta, Atlanta, that's right. He was with him really, there as well. He was, uh, he's been a – he is the most direct Shanahan disciple. I wouldn't call yeah. it anything really but that. I mean, I guess you could argue that McVeigh and, and LaFleur are Shanahan disciples as well because Shanahan had the bigger title than them. But remember, McVeigh – Yeah, but he wasn't their uh, – he wasn't their boss. Yeah. No, technically, you know, right. he was they he wasn't. Yeah, yeah. So no, I I think it's a uh, an interesting hire. I I wasn't um, obviously like I said he wasn't on the radar as, in terms of you know me thinking he was going to be a top candidate for the job. That really kind of came out of left field that they hired him. But I, I think it does make sense uh, in some ways for them to obviously bring an offensive mind into the building yeah. if they were. If they weren't satisfied with what Flores did, which I again we all thought was uh, was above par what he brought to that program, uh, given what they'd been in recent years. But if they weren't satisfied with that, then the other direction to go is go young and offense, and they get one of the uh, you know uh, more highly touted young offensive minds in the league at that respect. Uh, someone who you know has learned under uh, an accomplished. Uh, head coach in Kyle Shanahan. So yeah. you roll the dice, you bring him in. He does seem like he has the persona to fit in Miami. Definitely uh, seems like a, a really good um, uh, guy that, that can to bring into that culture and help create that culture. And a guy, you know, if they think two is the dude, if they really want, I mean, okay, you're going to want to bring a guy that can really help accelerate, accelerate mm -hmm. to a uh, quickly, and uh, he seems like a guy that can do that just by how he's going to potentially bring uh, innovative schemes to help maximize the best of what Tua does. So I, I think in that regard, um, I, I think it's an inspiring hire, whether or not it actually pans out to be a successful one, we'll find out. But it is one that I think a lot of people will be pretty excited about. Mike McDaniel's been with with uh, Kyle Shanahan. So if you go back through the history of the quarterbacks that Mike McDaniel has been around for the last eight years in the NFL. That's Kirk Cousins. That's Matt Ryan. That is Jimmy G. Those are the main three. Tua, his ceiling is all three of those guys, right? You'd argue that Tua at his best is a is the, is Kirk Cousins at maybe a little bit better. Tua at his best is Jimmy Garoppolo, hopefully maybe a little bit uh, more accurate, a little bit more mobile. Uh, Tua at, you know what I mean? At his best, you know, in a lot of ways, like Matt Ryan, not that mobile, accurate, not an incredible deep ball, but a high IQ type of player. That is that is what you know Tua is. So Mike McDaniel certainly, it's not like he's going from Josh Allen, like Brian Dable is sure. to, Dan to yeah. Daniel Jones. He's getting a quarterback with a very uh, you know similar set of skills, and you know what he's been there all the way with with Kyle Shanahan and these run games. So the best thing you can do for Tua in Miami uh, and and to build that program down there is to run the football really, really well and to dominate on defense. And that is a win now roster. It's a good, it's not a great roster. It's a really good roster. So I think it's a, it's, it's smart for him to take the job. I think especially now because the heat is on his owner, Stephen Ross, as we know, he's going to be on his best behavior because he's trying to make sure he doesn't lose his franchise like uh, a la, you know, uh, Donald Sterling for different reasons, but, I mean, if if it's proven fact that Brian Flores is saying is true that there's an owner offering to pay money cash to, to throw games, he will no longer be an owner in the NFL like that. They will absolutely will have to remove him. So yeah. he's going to be in his best behavior. Uh, that organization has got a black eye right now with everything that Flores is accusing them of and the relationship. So, you know, it could be a real win for him. If I were Mike McDaniel, though, I would want some assurances that if Tua doesn't work. We don't have to pick up his option, and I could maybe be guaranteed a chance at another quarterback. He's not my guy. That would be an interesting thing to see, or is it a lot like a Matt Nagy type of thing? No, you're brought in to make this dude great with Mitchell Trubisky, and if you don't, if it doesn't happen, you're gone and he's gone. You know what I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah, the jury's out. He's obviously harder to figure out than a Lovey Smith, who we've seen be there yeah. and do that. Um, you know, I, I'll just say quickly on the lovey thing. I, I agree with a lot of what you said. It does seem just like a, a, a sigh of relief in the building, like, a okay, let's, 
Let's relax. Let's stabilize. Let's get some balance back. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, what you said at the end of like being football serious, let's, let's almost just be a restart. We are a, a football team here in Houston with a talented, you know, quarterback who, who may or may not uh, be returning to the team. But if not, we have a young uh, uh, guy coming into his second year who we saw accelerate. Let's, let's just start to pick up the pieces and, and start fresh. And this seems like a good guy to do that with, because even if he's not going to be a long-term solution, Lovey's Lovey's a non-controversial guy. He's not going to, yeah. he's not going to bring a lot of, um, you know, fluctuation there. It's going to be pretty consistent. If they're not a, a 13 and four program, they're not going to be a three and 14 team either. They're going to be somewhere in the middle. And that's, you know, right now for Houston, that's probably a welcome site to just get back to, uh, you know, even and, and just yep. be, be competitive and, and start to build those pieces up again uh, with a, a NFL culture. Yeah, their fall from being up 20 to nothing on Patrick Mahomes that playoff game to where they were at the start of last year was right. Smooth, yeah, I mean, it's a, and it was crazy. And so for them, uh, you know, and they've hired some people that I, I think are just bad hires at an ownership level. And again, I mean, I think you and I are at the point with a lot of NFL fans. You, as you get older, you realize this as well, as you just understand more of the business side of the NFL. If you don't have good ownership, it's going to be always really hard to win. It's going to always be hard to win football games. Look at the, look at the teams that consistently win in this league. They have really solid ownership and they have solid management underneath the ownership. And they have a lot of, uh, you know, being on the same page. Houston is certainly not one of those organizations a lot like a, a Washington uh, commanders or a, uh, you know, a Chicago bears. There's, there's questions all over the organization on uh, 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 in ways like that. So for Houston, it, I absolutely think that's the best way to put it. They're just trying to get football serious with this move. And uh, you know, lovey was with the organization last year too. So it's not like he's coming in fresh, fresh. Uh, he has already been in Houston time, knowledge of the roster. And now it's just, Hey, uh, we're going to give you the keys to the to the kingdom and see what you can do with it. Definitely. Also, not a fan of the commanders, by the way. I was I was, uh, I was disappointed yeah, in that uh, choice. You no, know, I'll put it this way: I'm glad they're not my team. I'm glad I don't root for them. Yeah. I, I think um, I think that uh, a lot's going to come out still of like what exactly the the logos are going to be, all of that type of stuff. I, I I think they missed the mark on a couple opportunities with some other better names. But you know what? In a, two years from now, it's 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 not going to matter. Yeah, no, it's not. Uh, you know, hopefully Dan Snyder is long gone. We'll see what happens uh, at that point. But uh, no one's holding their breath. I don't his wife's in charge now. Dan is, is what, you know, <laughs> they, uh, yeah. you know, they have, they're totally, 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 you know, punished himself. We've got Super Bowl 56 coming up. And so, Mark, I, I want to throw some things your way here. We're going to talk some general facts about the Super Bowl before we dive into uh, Super Bowl game facts and um, some trivia there as well. So I'm going to ask you a couple questions here, see right. what you think the answer is. Uh, some of these I'll just kind of throw out as, uh, as facts as well. So the first one I'll just say, Super Bowl Sunday is the second largest food consumption day of the year in the United States. That's Behind next to, of course, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, yes, absolutely. So Which um, is a everyone, too. yes, absolutely, yeah, of course. And um, yeah. From Common denominator we're seeing here, uh, but yeah, the Super Bowl spreads. Uh, do you have a Do you have a go to by the way on your Super Bowl um, eatery no. plate? I mean, are you a wings? Do you want Miller wings Light. or Miller Light? And then um, right. um, no, I, you know what? To me, I put it this way: anytime I watch football, I really am not a big wings guy. I like more of the stuff. Uh, where I'm not worried about my hands and being messy. Like I, cause I'm watching the game. Like I'm watching the game. So like, I like things like a pizza where you just pick up, the, you know what I mean? It's not yep. as messy. I like things like a chip and dip or just a sandwich um, as opposed to like wings and messy food where you're, you know, ribs, you know, people do so. It's like, I know I, I can't handle that. I'm trying to watch the game and I got to be on my phone too much. If my hands a disaster. How could I be tweeting out hot takes? True point. That's a, that's a good point. I, I'm a, I'm a, a wing fan, but uh, I would say uh, like chili cheese dip would be like oh, my number one yeah, good uh, go to for 
for Super Bowl Sunday. It shall. Um, there are yes, <laughs> <laughs> there's no question about that. Maybe we'll get you. Uh, you know what? Maybe I'll ship you some of those Carolina Reaper wings to, uh, oh, to yeah, enjoy okay. <laughs> on Super Bowl Sunday. Dear God, I almost forgot about that. Two teams have uh, two, two teams share with the most Super Bowl losses in cool. the history of the game, and that is five Super Bowl losses that each of these teams possess. Can you name both of them? Uh, the New England Patriots is correct. Because they lost, I think, three. They've been to 11 before. Super Bowls. Yeah, they, they lost three before Brady got there because their first ever Super Bowl win was with Brady. And then they've lost. No, they. Or they and lost then they two. lost two with Brady. No, they lost three with no, Brady. They lost three with Brady. They, they, they must have lost two, two prior. Before Brady. Uh, yeah. Who else has lost? That would have been many? against the Green Bay Packers and uh, the Chicago Bears. Yeah, who else has lost that many? Uh, my guess would be, I mean, Buffalo lost how many, but then they didn't go back to any more. Correct. They lost four. Yeah. I mean, uh, lost so four they would be tied for second, but uh, this team lost five. And uh, uh, for several one, of those, any hit, it like had a player, like a random name, Hall of Fame quarterback. They had for three of these, I want to say. Uh, and I don't know for sure. They definitely had a Hall of Fame quarterback for two of these, at least, but I'm pretty sure three. Two of the losses or three of the losses? Three, correct. Uh, and they, uh, this, this team eventually went on to win with that Hall of Fame quarterback twice. Oh, Broncos. Correct. Yep. Uh, John Elway and the Broncos. Yeah, the Broncos lost five. New England Patriots have lost five. Uh, we kind of already touched on it. New England, with their 11 appearances, is the most by any team. Uh, appearances in a Super Bowl. So they, once again, thanks to Tom Brady for saving that franchise in several ways. Uh, the most watched Super Bowl, can you think of it? 141 million viewers. It's fairly recent within the past I decade. That, I think I know this one. Wasn't it, um, wasn't it uh, Denver, Seattle? It was not that game. This one ended in a pretty epic fashion. Oh, was it Packers, uh, Steelers? Nope. Uh, I don't know. A little bit more recent than that. Um, oh, 28 to three. It was not surprisingly. I thought it would be that one. You got the New England Patriots were involved really? with that. You pretty much could New against England that. Really New England? It was New England and Seattle in 2015. Uh, I knew Seattle. Was, I knew Seattle. That was stupid of me to guess the Broncos Seattle because they it was a blowout, but. I knew Seattle was involved. I don't know why. Yeah, 141 million viewers of that one. All right, this one, Mark, is very interesting. I'm going to include some facts, and then I'll kind of have you guess uh, other All parts right. of it. So Super Bowl One was not a sellout, and the average price of a ticket was $12, the lowest price being $6. That would amount to about uh, – the, the $12 average would amount to about $96 today. I can swing Obviously, that. that is not the current average. Now, keep in mind that this average is, you know, has a lot of outliers because the most yeah. expensive ticket uh, to the Super Bowl this year is in the range of seventy thousand dollars. Okay, yeah, I, but, I, I, I can't. Swing so, with that. that in mind, with knowing how how expensive the most expensive is, what was what would you say ballpark is the average ticket price? of the Super Bowl this year at SoFi Stadium. So I did see something that like Chad Johnson posted, like a screenshot of the tickets. And uh, he was complaining that they were all like way, 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 way too expensive. And I think, I mean, it's got to, if the, if the highest is, is 70, that, I mean, again, that weighs on your mean. It weighs on your average. Correct. Yeah, it hurts. I would say, oh, nine, 9,500. That's that's actually spot on. Nine thousand four hundred ninety-six dollars is the Whoa, average price. You were you were four dollars off. <laughs> so go. actually, if we were doing prices right, you would have lost. Uh, you you. I you sure I would have known. But uh, Screw you, the, Drew Carey. Currently, the cheapest ticket is going for fifty-seven hundred. Now, really? statistically, the closer it gets to Super Bowl Sunday, that price drops a little bit. But uh, the thought is that it's it won't dip below five thousand uh, any point soon. So just just to think about that uh is pretty crazy considering you know adjusted for inflation uh a hundred dollars was what you know a ticket would have been to super bowl one if we were buying it today obviously yeah. there's been so much more the halftime shows 
the venues are bigger things but so five a hundred and ninety five hundred is a time. far far away from a hundred I, so, I will say this. I'll, I will say this. I do think the NFL needs to do something in with the Super Bowl, I, especially as the TV game is just becoming so much more enjoyable to watch on TV as opposed to going to a stadium. I do True. wish the NFL would block out like a, you know, three thousand, you know, for Rams fans, three thousand for Bengals fans that sold given to the team directly to sell to like first chance season ticket holders. At a, at a at a at a price that would you know can't exceed a certain amount, you know what I mean? I think that would be really great if they did that. Maybe they do, and we're just not we're just not even close enough to understand that they do this. But I, I will say, shout out to T.J. Husmanzada, Husmanzada, the wide receiver Bengals, great. Uh, did you see that story going viral? He's he paid for like an eighty something year old Bengals fan to go. He got nice. him a ticket to the game. It was a viral video of this woman recording her father he's in his 80s lifelong Bengals fan oh i did see that video yes okay. illness and he and literally just sobbing as joe burrow and the Bengals beat the chiefs and uh tj husman zada stepped up and bought him a ticket and he's gonna be going to the game that's awesome that, really? that's what it's all about man that's that's really cool my little brother awesome. sent me that video and he goes maybe when we're in our 80s still waiting for the bears to make a super bowl <laughs> He's like, oh, some, you, can, you hope not. <laughs> some like recently retired Bears player will be like, hey, you two old guys, you want to go to the game? They it could, it, maybe it's like, you know, 62 year old Justin Fields at the time yeah. is like, oh, wow, look, uh, look at these guys. Let's, Take pity uh, in, these, in these old <laughs> brothers who have been just their whole lives waiting for this moment. There you go. All right, let's get to game facts of the Super Bowl. Now, I just picked out a compilation of about okay. 10 of these. And we'll see what you can guess. Some are a little bit more um, obscure than others, uh, but we'll go with most sacks in the Super Bowl. Now, this is just oh. in the game itself, not uh, over time. So, most sacks like in a single game. Super Bowl. Is it Von and Miller? He won an he won an MVP. So this is it's a tie between three players, and the number is three. So three sacks in the Super Bowl. Richard, three dead. players. Now, I would not have guessed. Definitely wouldn't have guessed one of them for sure. Probably two. Or no, I'm so it's a four-way tie. Four-way tie okay. with three. Got a four-way. Can you name? Can you name? I'll, I'll let you name. See if you can name two of the four. So is Dent? Because it's Von pretty Miller difficult. Not it. Von Miller is not one of them. Richard he had Dent? two and a half sacks. Richard Dent is not one of them. Uh, anyone from the '85 Bears? Is it Dan Hampton? Nope. No oh, one. Man. No one before. 97 is the old is the oldest reggie white that is correct All reggie right. white in 1997 one. had three sacks. reggie white um warren sap in that ba buccaneers team nope anyone from that Buccaneers? simeon rice would have been uh he had two sacks in that game but he okay. that is uh no one from that game uh is in i think who else am i missing somebody's like come on this one is more obvious recently and you're like this guy had a great game no these are honestly they're all kind of difficult <laughs> was, was there's someone for that patriots team in the comeback versus atlanta no no i'm trying to think well well not not the patriots team atlanta, atlanta though that uh was it yeah it was a guy and he kind of became a bust after that right he was like a well, i wouldn't i wouldn't call him a bust i i don't think he I don't think he reached um, the potential everyone okay. maybe thought, but he's I'm, a good player. Good player. I'm close. I'm close. Just read him off. I'm, I'm, Brady I'm, Jarrett for Brady the, the Atlanta Jarrett. Falcons. Uh, Coney Ely in 2016 for the Carolina Panthers. Panthers. Coney Ely in that Panthers. And then I should have known this, but Darnell Dockett for the Cardinals against the Steelers had three in that 09 Super Bowl. Oh, yeah. So that, those are the four right there. James and then Harrison obviously was someone was going to be a guess of mine. James Harrison was going to be a guess of mine. Yeah. Yeah. That would have been a, a, a good guess too. Um, Dante Hightower, Von Miller, Demarcus oh. Ware among those with uh, multiple sacks in the uh, well, Super Bowl I think, game. I think uh, Aaron Donald's going for that record this year. I, I mean, he, oh, hey, he's got a good chance, right? Absolutely. I, I'll talk a little bit about it, you know, when we get to it. But I, I think Aaron Donald is. is well, let's uh, ask right now. Do you. Do you think Aaron Donald breaks the record? How many would he need? Three and a half? He would need three and a half. It's a big game. It's a pretty dominant game. God. But if a lot of I people are picking him gets, to be the MVP, so if I that's the case. I don't think he gets three and a half. I bet he gets like two and a half and like a strip. 
fumble and like wins yeah. the MVP. If if he has if the if the Rams win and Aaron Donald has over two sacks and like a and a forced fumble or something like that, uh, and they really stifle, I think Aaron Donald MVP is not a bad bet. I wonder what the odds are in that. I bet I bet they're not as as great as you'd like them to be. But I, I do think Aaron Donald sees this as a real legacy defining game. I, I've said I said on my show last Saturday, I think Aaron Donald almost his legacy has the most to grow from a giant performance in a win because he's battled a little bit like in his own era with TJ Watt with like, Oh, these guys, but like he could Aaron Donald with a, a Super Bowl victory and an MVP in the Super Bowl. I mean, that's where you start to get to like, no, no, that's like Reggie white territory of like, and right, yeah. Taylor. like he's already got the regular yeah. season stuff. If he has a postseason game like that, he could, you know, you could really put him in the, he belongs in the Reggie White, Lawrence Taylor, greatest defensive player of all time talk. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a lot riding on it. And obviously if he dominates, uh, you'd imagine that that also equates to a Rams victory pretty yeah, easily. Yeah, I agree. Longest touchdown run in Super Bowl history. No. Is it someone famous? Nope. Mm. I believe this guy was in the league for a total – of six years, and I think he was pretty good for like three of those. What decade? Two thousands. Oh, huh. um, it was a seventy-five yarder. Holy smokes! I'm trying to think now. Seventy-five yarder. A team in the two thousands had a really long rush, untouched. It's not, like, it's not like Sean Alexander in that Seattle game, but he he had a better career. Sean Alexander's a good player. I'm trying to think who did, who had like an okay career. Can you right, give me the team? I know. I feel like it'll give it away, but all, all right, right, that's yeah, fine. I that's fair. It, you were, let's just say you were, you were, you had the right game. Seattle versus uh, Steelers. Yep. Was it a Steelers player then? It was, it was. Is it? Well, oh wait, it's going to bug me now. His nickname was fast. <laughs> so <laughs> who was it? Who was they it? called him fast? Willie Parker. Willie Parker. Fast Willie Parker. He was the he, he was the the light, thunder and lightning to Jerome Bettis. Correct. Yep. Yep. He had uh he had a couple of good seasons with the Steelers, went to Washington after that, and kind of just his Willie career Parker. just uh dissipated pretty quickly. Um, but yeah, a 75 yard touchdown run behind a great block from Alan Fanica that, that was sprung rushing, him. That was a rushing Super Bowl, man. That was a that it was. Was, that game, I remember I watched it at Ryan Coon's house wearing a Sean Alexander jersey. Nice. I nice. don't know why, but that like there was a two-year stretch where Sean Alexander was like dominant. Uh, man, oh yeah, no, he. I mean, the he year before, broken. I think he broke the um, Ladanian Tomlinson's yeah. touchdowns in a season record. Yeah, and we, um, and my my dad bought Phil and I, uh, my little brother, uh, uh, Sean Alexander jerseys, and then they made it to the Super Bowl. I was all in on Matt Hasselbeck and Sean Alexander, rooting for them. Well, Michael, my younger brother, became a Seattle, Seattle Seahawks fan during that Super Bowl, uh, just to spite me, and yeah. uh, he, he knew I was rooting for the Steelers, so he said, "I'm going to root for the Seahawks." Then, how's little that? Brother, that? <laughs> That's right. Uh, typical, typical younger brother there. All right, so yeah, that was the Super Bowl 40, 75-yard touchdown run by Willie Parker. How about the okay. longest touchdown pass? This also was in the 2000s. Oh, man. Um, and maybe you can get the receiver or the quarterback, but you probably are getting both if you know one one of them. Was it? Uh, did Randy Moss have a big one from Brady? No. No, receiver, quarterback. Um, did Peyton Manning have a big one of Marvin Harrison? Nope. Uh -huh. Well, he did, but it it wasn't uh, it wasn't this. This was an eighty-five I yarder. I can't think and, of the play. And the receiver I went on to play in a Super Bowl a few years later with another team. Oh man! And let uh -huh. me just say, you should know, you should know this receiver. TJ. Well, oh, okay. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute now. Then I'm gonna guess. I'm gonna wait a minute. I'm gonna guess. I hope I'm. I hope I'm right that he played with them. I'm gonna guess. Then I'm gonna guess. Uh, Musi Muhammad. It is. It's correct. Yeah, Moose. The Moose is loose. Moose. All right. Now, can you? Do you remember? Jake Delhomme. Jake Delhomme. Jake Delhomme to 
Moose and Muhammad, 85 yards to the longest touchdown pass in Super Bowl history, I don't, Super Bowl 38. I don't think that will be broken in this game. I do think I don't a, think so either. I do think there's a possibility that 75 yarder though will eventually go. In this that, game? I don't know if it's this game, but the 75 yard touchdown run seems more plausible than a, than someone getting an 86 yard touchdown reception. Because you know, you know what I mean? Like yeah, but if we're talking about this game in particular, man, you got Jamar Chase and Cooper Cup, yeah, then, who no, could take right. the top off of any defense. In this um, game, I would agree that the touchdown pass more likely. But I yeah. do think overall a seven like that's such a such a a long throw. But also, you know, you have to make, you know, with with a run, with a run with with a long run, it, they can happen because you see in the regular season, like it's like a team on their own eight yard line and they line up in a in a, in a bunch formation and all it takes is breaking through that first level of the defense and the guy can yeah, go. Yeah. And then you're right? off. Right. You're For off. Sure. And running. So with, you know, with a touchdown pass of, of that length, you know, it's either got to be a, a wide open deep shot or it's like a screen and a guy makes a bunch of people miss, but uh, that's a crazy stat. Yeah. Musin Muhammad. Good for him. Largest margin of victory. It's 45 points. So it's not it's not the 85 Bears then. The 85 Bears was, are second largest yeah, margin of victory 40, with 36 points, a 46 to 10 win over New England. Uh, oh, this team Seattle, Seattle over the Broncos. You would think it is not. It is the not them. A couple late. The score of this game was 55 to 10. What was the decade? This would have been this was Super Bowl 24, so this was the 90s. The early 90s. No, no, no. This was the 80s then. 55 to 10. Was it Joe Montana and the Niners beating down on someone? It was the Niners. Who did they beat down on? I don't know. This was in nine. This was in. Uh, hold on. I gotta double check this now. So 24 was 19. It was 1990. So it was the, the 89 season. 1990, it was the 49ers against oh, the Denver Broncos. Oh, Broncos. Sorry, Jeff. And, uh, and the 49ers uh, wrecked. So, this yeah, 55 to 10, 49ers win as the largest margin of victory. That is one, Mark. I'm not – that's going to be a while before that's yeah. broken, if it ever is. That's just like – that's so lopsided, unbelievably Especially lopsided. Especially the modern NFL where you can – teams i mean we saw it in that broncos and you know, like eventually it, it's just the game is played differently you have a lead teams will score late like they won't yeah. get um uh they won't get blown blown out like that e even though last year's super bowl was not that way i mean the 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 yeah the the chiefs never scored like really late i mean the 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 bucks just pounded them the the whole game the most scoring touchdowns in not just a game but over their career in the Super Bowl, the most scoring touchdowns in the Super Bowl for one player is a total of eight. The next closest is five. Is Gronk so, five? Gronk has five. He is tied with someone else with five. Does and Jerry this Rice person, have eight? Jerry Rice has eight. Yes, you are correct. So Jerry Rice has eight touchdowns Those in the Super easier Bowl. easier ones because you, you, you start to look at the teams you know played a lot. So your man right. goes to the Cowboys, the Patriots, the, the Niners. You know what I mean? Yeah. I believe Thurman Thomas has four, um, but yeah, can you can you guess the other person that Gronk's tied with with five? With five, uh, is it a part of the New England dynasty? It is not, but it's a running back. A running back with five. Uh, Think Smith. of a running back that's been in a lot of Super Bowls. Emmitt Smith. Emmitt Smith. There you go. Emmitt Smith has five touchdowns in the Super Bowl. Yeah, Troy. Uh, this one is one that like I've always known, but then I constantly forget the name. Okay. So I'm wondering if this is probably the same with you as well. The only MVP selected from the losing team. Oh yeah. Crap. I mean, I've known this one before, but I'm not going to think of it. Do you know the team? No. Okay. It was a Dallas Cowboys linebacker for Super Bowl five in which they lost to the Colts 16 to 13. It was Chuck Howley. Chuck uh, Holly in yeah, Super Bowl five, the only MVP to be selected from the losing team. But like a mat, like the, what a weird like award to be given. Like after the Super Bowl, 
your your whole team's sulking and they're like hey come over here we need to award you the mvp like oh great okay you know that's just one of those things though like i don't know i don't think that'll ever happen again and it it just doesn't because sports shouldn't sports shouldn't work that way but it's a lot like it was bullshit that andre guadala won the mvp against lebron james like lebron james should have been the mvp even though the Cavs lost in that series against the Warriors. That's the closest thing in modern times. You can be like, no, 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 that doesn't, it doesn't make sense. We all know LeBron was the best player in that series, but like, uh, right. I don't see that happening in the NFL again. No. Howley did intercept a pass and recovered or intercepted two passes and oh, recovered Jesus. a fumble in Jesus. that game. So he did have a pretty dominant performance, uh, against the, uh, Unitas led, uh, Colts there. But, um, Nonetheless, Chuck Holly remains the only one. And as you mentioned, probably will be the only player. I just got this uh, notification. It, this is a field Yates tweet. I don't know if you're going to get to this, but listen to this. Joe Burrow's Super Bowl debut will come earlier in year two than any other starting QB that was drafted number one overall. So he's the quickest number one overall pick to get to a Super Bowl. Interesting. I did not know that. Matt Stafford, he was the number one pick year 13. This is the latest a number one overall pick has ever gotten to a Super Bowl wow. in year wow. 13. I uh, just go, that is a funny little crazy, crazy little. Uh, just the latest that-, that they've gotten to their first or just the yeah. latest that they've gotten their period? The latest they've gotten to their first, like to their okay. first Super Bowl, yeah. Wow, wow. Fascinating. Good stuff right there. All right, how about a little fantasy point trivia from the Super Bowl? Okay. Uh, so this one... I don't, it, it's probably not fair, but I'll, I'll have you guess anyway, because this is going to be pretty hard to guess, I would imagine. But the most quarterback fantasy points in a Super Bowl game goes to this player with 41.9 points in the 90s. Okay, so this is in the 90s at fantasy football. Yeah, so this, um, this quarterback um, put up some numbers, put up some numbers in, in, the, in the 90s. Still regarded probably as the best quarterback statistical performance in a Super Bowl. Um, would it be that it wouldn't be that 55 10 we were just talking about? Would it be Joe Montana in that way? No, no. Or would it be, would it, was, um, Favre had a really good Super Bowl? Was it Favre? Nope. Who is it? I don't know. It is, uh, Steve Young. Uh, in that six Steve touchdown Young. pass game six against touchdown. the Chargers, uh, Steve Super Bowl twenty nine, Steve Young had three hundred and twenty five oh, yards passing, man. six touchdowns. He also added forty nine yards rushing, yeah, he's which helped rushing. put him over the edge there with that four. I should have known it would have been a guy who ran the ball well. Yeah, good for Steve Young. St- yeah. that he's Me. incredible. Right, Jerry Rice scored the exact same number of points in that game. By the way, forty one point <laughs> nine. But this running back has the most fantasy points ever in a Super Bowl from a non-quarterback with 47.9 points. And I, this is this one, I didn't think he had this dominant of a performance. I knew he had a great game, but I did not know he had this dominant of, of a performance. Was it in a this, winning effort? It was in a winning effort. What decade? In a, in a uh, is in the past decade. And... He had this running back had 14 catches oh, in this game. Oh, oh, White from uh, James White. It is James White. He had three touchdowns. I forgot he had three touchdowns in this yeah, game. Yeah, he was 14 catches, was the, 139 yards. That was the um, that was the uh, Falcon Super Bowl, right? Yep, it was the comeback, 28 the 28 to three comeback game. 47.9 point fantasy points. Now, obviously, no one's playing their fantasy games that late, but DraftKings, etc., uh, a lot of points there. All right. Let's go back to just general statistics. Most passing yards in a Super Bowl. Uh, wasn't it Brady or wasn't it Nick Foles, one of those two in that game? It was in that game, yes, and it was Tom Brady. 505 yeah. yards passing against Philadelphia in Super Bowl 52. He also had the most attempts with 61 pass attempts in that game. That was game. a crazy game. That, that a wild one, that, game. Looking back on that game, it's one of those where if you're Tom Brady, you – you have to you have to look back at the film of that game and be like, man, oh man, oh man. He was great. He was incredible in that game. And he misses a fingertip catch on a weird trick play call. And he and he um and he uh and and, and his defense can't get a stop. The whole Malcolm Butler controversy, that was a weird game. 
very weird game, definitely, but uh, but a really good one nonetheless, as you mentioned, and uh, some records broken in that game. How about most rushing touchdowns in a single Super Bowl game? Most actually rushing touchdowns. Uh, I don't know. Give me a decade. Give me something. This is in late nineties. Late uh, Terrell Davis. It is. Yep. Terrell wow. Davis had three rushing touchdowns against green Bay. That was the infamous uh, migraine game from yes. TD where he could barely see, but they needed him in there. Mike Shanahan said, you got to go in there, man. They're not going to believe we're running the football. This um, one for John. This one's for John. Absolutely. Yep. TD helping, uh, obviously a, a big rushing attack, really carrying John Elway at that point in his career, for sure. I believe that was also the, um, windmill game with John Elway, where he dove what? forward and, and got uh, tossed around, uh, not windmill, but helicopter nonetheless. Yeah. All right. This is a cool stat. Since 2000, only one wide receiver has topped 150 yards receiving in the Super Bowl. Really interesting. Oh, okay. And that, that alone is surprising. Can you name that receiver? This receiver had 152 yards. Musin Muhammad. It was not. No, yeah. Despite that 85 yarder, it was uh, not Musin Muhammad. Who, you know what? Was it? You know, was, this is a guy that's had one of those, like, he's never, I don't know if he's ever made a Pro Bowl, but he's stuck around the league for, and he is still, I believe, in the league. Would it be De, like a Deshaun Jackson? Is not Deshaun Jackson. Oh man, who would who would that have been? Um, I don't know. He, yeah, he is currently still in the league. Plays for the Houston Texans right now. This oh, would be Brandon Cooks. Brandon Cooks. No, it's not. Wait. Um. Um. He did this in Super Bowl Fifty One. Five years ago, who the bleep was it? I don't know. It's going to piss me it was off. Danny Amendola. Danny Amendola. The New England Patriots Point. at the time. That was obviously with Tom game. throwing for 505 yards. He's passing it around quite a bit. Um, James White had 136 yards now that could be uh, the year before. Jamar, that could be broken with Jamar Chase or Cooper Cup. Yes, it could. Absolutely. Pro- that's a good prop one to bet. Like, will that record be broken? Because that I bet you could get some good odds on that. Yeah. Five years later, uh, I would. I would probably bet on that one for sure. Uh, that is all I have for the unique Super Bowl game facts. Yeah. Thanks for playing. Um, we have some prop bets to look at. So you, you're yeah. kind of alluding to that. So we can kind of go back and forth on this because I know you had a couple that you said were interesting well, as well. So if you want to. Wanna... Uh, I just want to look at, talk about the actual kind of lines as we actually prep the yeah. game. Go through your props and then okay. you know, my betting will lead us kind of more actually into the game talk here. Sure. So a couple of these are fun ones and a couple of them are just, you know, general, uh, just about the game. So one of them, who's going to score first, the Rams or the Bengals? What would you bet on that one? Well, I, I think um, the Rams scoring first, uh, you know, every, whoever gets the ball first, I think is going to score. I think it's going to be a high scoring game. Gotcha. Um, I, I, I like the Rams to score first. I think, I think at home momentum, even if, even if, uh, since he gets the ball to start, I think it's a maybe a shaky start. I think there's a little bit of nerves, jitters. Uh, maybe you, maybe they got a first down, but then like a three and out after that. Um, uh, and so I, but the Rams, I think there'll be there'll be energy juice. Sean McVay comes out with a unique play call in those first that first drive. They find a, a Cooper Cup on a big play or a, or a Odell Beckham on a big play. And that's uh, all it I, takes, right? take the Rams to score first if I had to bet I never like betting those things because they're way too nerve-wracking yes absolutely um all right the national anthem this one's every year the over under oh, Mickey Guyton. is currently set at 95 and a half seconds now looking through that's recent history last year's was two minutes and 17 seconds Who was so that this would man? that was by Jasmine Sullivan and Eric Church the year Church. before Demi Lovato went one minute 49. And so really, so 95 is the average. That's a minute and a half uh, or minute 35. She's a young up and coming star. She is a country music artist. I had a feeling she's going to go over. I think this is a, I think this is a big moment for her in her career. It's a, you know what I mean? Uh, I think it's a huge moment. Like, you know, they're, they're going to talk through, 
with her agent and all that stuff. Like, don't, don't rush this one. Like, take this time. Like, this, show off your range, show off your vocals, make a statement with this. I don't think it's much over, but I would take the over on that. I would take the over as well. The under has hit in terms of that mean right there at 95 and a half seconds. That has hit just twice since Super Bowl 41. Billy Joel went exactly a minute 30 in Super Bowl 41. And uh, let's see, it was Kelly Clarkson went a minute 34 uh, in Super Bowl 46. Oh. Everyone else has hit the over and some have gone way over. So yeah, yeah, I would, uh, I would, would say it's start. a good bet to go with the over there. Without All right. You get it. This one you'd be much better to uh, answer and respond to than I. Which song will be performed first at halftime in the uh, halftime performance featuring five artists? I have a strong thought on this. Do they give you options? Okay. They give you five options here. Okay. Still Dre, The Next Episode, California Love, Family Affair, or Other? Other. I think it starts with Eminem. And I think I think the lights go dark. And I think the first thing you hear is either lose yourself or you hear the opening of Slim Shady. It's a dark stadium. Yeah. And all of a sudden you just hear bing, 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 bing. That's my guess. I have yeah. a feeling, you know, if you watch the the commercial for the halftime show, the first artist you see is Eminem. So I think there's maybe a clue in there. I if you have if you want to bet an Eminem song, go with it. I I think you're gonna get Eminem, lose yourself. Or uh, or Slim Shady to start. I disagree only because I think that would imply that Eminem's going to be the build up to Eminem at some point in this performance. So I think to start it off, there might go with uh, with something else. I I'm not familiar with many of these songs. I my guess would be California Love though because I think that was uh that was Tupac and Dre I believe with the, in that song and I think maybe they they want to kind of feature that in some way I'm better, I, it's I'm a better total guess how many touchdowns trail davis had in the super bowl <laughs> yeah, than, yeah, than, than i gotta be honest um here's another uh prop bet along those lines will all five performers team up for a song yes because they only get 12 minutes and so from what i what if there's five performers each one of them gets a minute 30 it, max yeah. like of, of solo time so i think there's going to be a moment it towards the middle or very end when all five are are in on a song it'll probably be a dre song uh, uh because i think he's really the headliner headliner for this sure. um uh, and so uh I, and so that would be my guess i'd say yes i would say uh yes as well i am curious how they would rank this because is it just that, like, do they have to have, like, the whole song all five performers, or is it just, oh, they're joining in for the chorus real quick, and then they're going yeah. into a different mashup? Tricky. I don't know how that works, but I would I would bet that as well. How many songs? Over, under, nine and a half. I That mean, seems like a lot That songs. does seem like a lot, but there's five artists, so each one of them gets one. So you're automatically at five. Then you say to yourself, that is... I so that's what i mean what didn't you say they get, they only get 12 minutes though is that what you said I think that's what it, the length is like of the actual performance time i read somewhere is like 12 minutes i would say i honestly i don't i think you take the over in that because all it takes for them to count a song is like you know a couple notes 30 seconds you know what i mean right and then they I move on to the next eminem, yeah i can see eminem spending his minute doing four different songs like you know what i mean that's just how yeah. he that's true that's true a mashup could be uh I'm on the way there. I have two others here, Mark. All right. Total number of players to attempt to pass. This one's always two and a half every year because it's saying, is there going to be a non-quarterback to attempt to pass? Trick play. Um, or, or I guess, you know, a quarterback could get hurt and then the, the backup comes in and attempts to pass. You got your three right, players. For but I think for, for this, we'll just kind of, uh, let's just say, is there going to be a non-quarterback in your mind uh, to attempt to pass in this game? Who's the backup in L.A.? I I that's a great know. question. I don't even know. So I'm yawning. I apologize. I don't, I honestly can't think of it. And you know, it's, it's probably a name that we're like, ah, oh, yeah, but I can't think of it. And who's the backup to Joe Burrow? It's that, um, what's his name? Ripley, I think, or, um, um, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know what you're talking about. I it's... would say trick play high probability. I would actually take the yes on this is a fun one. And I bet the odds are pretty good on it. You put like 10 bucks probably to double your money, something like that. 
I would say, I would say yes. Odell Beckham Jr. has done this a bunch. I think Cooper Cup's capable of doing it as well. I I think it comes from the Rams if it happens, but I would say yes. I agree that it comes from the Rams. I'm going to go with the punter Johnny Hecker because oh, he Johnny Hecker. That guy can sling it, and he's done fake punts in the past. I could see them pulling out, you know, something crazy in this game to throw the Bengals off and uh, and kind of just put the hammer down. So I'm going to guess Johnny Hecker throw, attempts a pass in this game. Um, and then finally, Mark, <laughs> this one, this one's crazy. The color of the Gatorade bath. Yeah, is it going to be smart. lime green and yellow? That's they, they combine all three as yeah. an option. Or is it going to be clear, like as in water, uh, blue, orange, red, or purple? Blue, orange. I'm going to go with um, – I, I, never, I never know what to do. I think the Bengals were rocking orange. So if the okay. Bengals win, I'd say orange. If, so if you like the Bengals, I'd say orange. I think if you like the Rams – I'd say go with the traditional, like the lime green. Yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to go yellow, but that's still a part of that, the lime yeah. green one. So I'm, I'm going to go with the yellow as well. I think that'll, that'll be the winning color, but it's an interesting one. I wonder if people even took tabs on what all the colors were uh, for yeah. the past year's Super Bowls. Don't have that on hand, so apologies for that. But, uh, but yeah, right. if you want to look, uh, we can look at some of these spreads now. Yeah, I mean, I, listen, I just want to look at the big three. You know, you know, obviously the money line, the Bengals are the underdog. Uh, they're a four-point underdog. The Bengals are one are plus 160 in the money line. I think there's some real value there. Um, it's a pretty decent number. I also think if you like the Bengals a lot, getting the Bengals plus four points, there's real value in that as well. If you think this is going to be a field goal game, you know, you you got to roll with that. You 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 got to take the Bengals there. I think the biggest thing though, and I, and, and this is again, as of this, this afternoon, the last time I checked these lines, the Rams uh, and the Bengals over is 48.5. I certainly think that's a, that's something you should put some money on. I, and, I, and I know it's only minus 112, not a ton of value there, but I, I just have a good, I have a good feeling that if you're looking for a simple bet and you just want to have some fun, watch this game, root for points. I think there's going to be points. 30 to 20 gets you the over. Uh, I certainly think that's possible uh, for it, it, no matter who you like in this game. I, you know, I, I think that 25-24 uh, gets you the over, and you're rooting for points in the Super Bowl. It's always a fun thing to do. Um, I think it's very interesting that, the, that, the, that uh, the Bengals are still plus four. I think the line will move on that. I think the public, as the game gets closer, will take that, and you'll get the Bengals plus three, plus three and a half. So if you want to jump on it now at plus four, I, I don't. I don't think that's a. It's a bad call. It, it's enticing to me, to say the least, because I do think the Bengals have every right to be in this game and be uh, frisky to win this game as well. So uh, yeah, we're going to disagree a little bit on this one. I actually think the Rams are going to win fairly convincingly in this game. Um, so I would take the Rams minus four in that regard. I also would take the under because my my prediction for the score, even though those are so tough to do. Um, I put out that I think it's going to be either 28, 17 or 28, 20 Rams. Um, so you're right there. And so, yeah, so it's, it's, it's too close for me to like, like I, I wouldn't love betting the under, but if I had to bet one of the, those two, I'm going on uh, the under on that one. Um, because I, I just see, um, potentially some sloppy offensive play from both sides at various points in this game. Um, and, and so at that point, I would have to err on the side of, uh, of the under on that one. Uh, there was one that I forgot to mention in terms of the prop bets that we can kind of talk about here, though, with that. The first turnover will be a fumble interception or a turnover on downs. Um, to me, I'm going an interception, and I think, Stafford and I think it happens from Burrow. I think Burrow throws a pick first. I think, I think both quarterbacks end up throwing a pick in this game. Yeah, I think you got to go interception. I'd like to see the odds on that. I'm sure interception is the is the least is the, is the least bang for your buck. Um, turnover Probably, yeah. downs is is clever though. These are both aggressive teams that like to go for it on fourth down, and they both have you know defensive lines that are playing really really well right now. So you I, could do I, a little bit of a parlay of Johnny Hecker attempting a pass and then failing 
Yeah. And so you get the, the, the over on the two and a half attempted passes and the turnover on downs. That would on be the, a the huge hit. I'm sure that would be a <laughs> huge, huge hit. If you, I bet that'd be five bucks into, you know, into something like 150. I bet that's good money. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I think that's those, that's a fun one. I didn't realize that was a, that was a prop bet you could find. I think that those type of things, listen, if you're new to gambling, I, I think you always try to, you start with an over and under because those are, then you give you something very easy to root for and you know what you're rooting for and it's, and it's easy to wrap your head around. I think if you're, if, or I think you just pick a money line and say, listen, I'm just putting five bucks that the Rams will win or 10 bucks that the Bengals win, you know, whatever, you know, just do something uh, fun like that. Um, and then, or if you're doing prop stuff, rooting for an interception to be the first time a turnover happens, I think is really fun. I think it keeps it interesting Definitely. and, and as always gamble responsibly bet within your means. Uh, that could be a really fun one for sure. You got any other spreads that, uh, no, I mean, that, those that we should go over. over. I think that, I think the plus four, again, if you like the yep. Bengals to keep it close, that is something you got to jump on now. Cause I think that's going to move. I bet that line moves as we get closer. I think the bank, the money, the favorites, the, the overwhelming public is going to keep rolling on Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, they're kind of a, a, a darling right now. You're getting all the great quotes already from Joe Burrow at media day, day one today. Uh, I think if you like the Bengals at around three and if keep it close to field goal, t- jump on them at plus four. So just in general, looking at the game, then what are your predictions of this? Cause I've kind of outlined, obviously that, you know, I think the Rams will win uh, by two possessions, uh, if not by eight. Uh, what, uh, how do you see this one playing out? And are you still taking the Rams? Cause I know when we talked last week, yeah. that was your initial thought. I think this game is the type of game that you, you have big, you have big runs from both teams at certain moments. I think that the Rams will jump out to an early lead. I think that the moment will be very big for Cincinnati. And I do think the crowd will have a pro Rams feel. The only people that can afford a lot of these ticket prices are rich celebrities who are already in LA who are going to be wearing a lot of Rams gear and, you know, a it's point. a popular thing to do. I, I, I truly feel that way. There's something to that. I also think the fact that you're playing in your home stadium, there's just something to that. The Rams have been home now for m- many weeks. And I know that the Bengals will be in LA and they're going to, you're they're They're in LA now. And it's not like it's going to be last minute travel or anything like that. I always, I always uh, feel though, it, it, you know, it's, there's, if there's things that have happened in the past, that you can go off of, use them. I mean, we saw it happen last year with the Bucks playing at home. They were a different kind of dominant. I mean, it would just, uh, it just was that way. And again, it's a similar thing in the sense that you have a young star quarterback with some great offensive weapons, but a shaky offensive line against a veteran quarterback with a dominant defensive line. It's a similar, uh, you know, situations. And they're both playing historically at home for the first time. And now the second time ever. So I think there's going to play a factor in that, but, Unlike uh, Kansas City last year, I think because even though the Bengals' offensive line isn't great, there's continuity to it. And they're not injured. It's not like since uh, Kansas City last year where it's like, holy crap, we have to re- completely replace two all, uh, all Pro Bowl tackles in one week and try to figure it out. It messes up everything. Um, I think Joe Burrow also is just – uh, better at understanding his athleticism than than Mahomes, and he doesn't extend the plays necessarily in that way that Mahomes does. He'll look to run quicker. He'll look to just get north and south as opposed to Patrick does a lot of stuff that I think got himself into trouble in last year's Super Bowl. So I think, though, eventually by midway through the second quarter, the game will slow down for Cincinnati. I think it looks a lot like the game against Kansas City. I think, can't, I think you see the Rams jump to an early lead. It looks like it could be a runaway type of thing. I like the Bengals to get a touchdown late in the second and second quarter, maybe another field goal. And all of a sudden the game going to halftime is pretty interesting. Joe Burrow, he had maybe a pick. He got beat up a little bit, two or three sacks in the first half. Uh, Also some quarterback knockdowns getting beat up a little bit. Aaron Donald looks to be running away with a, uh, with a player of the game and MVP Stafford hits Cooper cup on a big play early. Uh, So far is electric. But then I think that momentum carries over to the Bengals in the second half. Uh, but I think it, when a push comes to shove, midway through the fourth quarter, that Rams defense will get another big play, another big sack. Matt Stafford moves the chains enough, finds Cup enough, 
the Rams are able to run the ball with their unique running game and Sean McVay and, and their style of running the football. It is very, uh, the, it's only matched in the NFL by Kyle Shanahan. I think they, that uh, McVay is, will learn a ton to go back and look at that Patriots game and how they, they uh, turtled in that game offensively. And I think you'll see them be aggressive in the fourth quarter and that'll pay off for them. I like the Rams to win. I think it's a really entertaining game. I don't think there's ever a moment where you're counting out the Bengals. I think Burrow makes the plays of the game. I think we're going to leave this game on Monday saying, good God, that Joe Burrow is so impressive. And this Bengals team is, is a real future ahead of them. This is not a flash in the pan. Um, but I think that Matt Stafford plays well. I think he ends up winning the MVP. I think he throws for three touchdowns and interception, makes a one big play with his feet, but keeps drives alive, spreads the ball around enough. And I think Matt Stafford, the Rams win along the lines of 30 to 24 in a win uh, over, over Cincinnati, maybe 33, 24, they tack on a late field goal to, to extend it, you know, make it a two possession game uh, to keep, uh, to keep the Bengals at bay. Uh, but I think it's entertaining. I think it's fun. I think it's close. Uh, and I think that uh, we will again, be talking about next Monday that Joe Burrow is something special. And the NFL is uh special uh, is, is lucky to have a special talent like him playing right now. To, to compete against Mahomes and Allen and the great young AFC quarterbacks. So I see this one starting off uh, fairly slowly. I see both teams kind of trying to figure each other out, and I think both are going to try and um, start by winning the line of scrimmage. Both have very yep. talented running backs. I think they're going to try and run the ball a lot early and then take their timely shots uh, to their star playmakers, Cooper Cup, Jamar Chase. So I think – They'll sprinkle in some play action deep shots there, but I think they're going to both try and go run heavy, at least in the first quarter, eke into the second quarter. And then coming into the second half, they really start to open up their offense a lot more yep. and, uh, and start to air it out. So I agree with you in terms of the flow of the game. Um, I think ultimately the Bengals really, really poor offensive line is going to be magnified by what has clearly been the best defensive line in the postseason so far this year in the Rams. I think if you're going to put two to three on Aaron Donald, you might be successful 85, 90% of the time, but you're still going to have to account for Von Miller, who is way more fresh than most people in this postseason. I mean, he's, he was on a snap count for quite a bit of time. He had, you know, the, uh, the early injury and things like that. So he's a little bit more fresh at this point of the season than most of these guys. Uh, Leonard Floyd, similar yep. situation, a guy that's really played great as of late coming into his own uh, after so many years of just not really living up to that potential. So there's, there's too many guys to account for, for an offensive line that's struggled to do so uh, throughout the year. And even just going back to last year as well. So that's going to be the biggest issue for them. The Bengals' biggest friend in that is going to be Joe Mixon having a great start to this game. We'll see if he's able to do that or not. Um, but I think that the defensive line for the Rams is, is going to be the biggest uh, issue for Joe Burrow and company. And as cool and calm and collected as he is, it's just going to be difficult, in my view, for him to be able to get those opportunities deep to Jamar Chase or T. Higgins when I don't see the time being there, the timing uh, being allotted for them to pull off those plays. So that's where I think the Bengals are going to get into trouble in the second half. I think it'll be a close game, maybe something like a 17-10 or 17-14 at the break, something around there. But I think in the second half when the Rams come out and are able to uh, get that passing game going a little bit more and starting to apply some more pressure, I think that's when the Bengals are going to find themselves in a situation where they're trying to play catch up and trying a little bit too much. And that's when, you know, Burrow may make an untimely interception or Aaron Donald breaks through for one of those sacks, uh, sack fumble type of situations. And, uh, and things kind of get out, out of hand uh, from there on. I have the Rams winning, as I said, you know, 28 to 20, 28, 17, somewhere in that range. Um, and I ultimately think that Cooper Cup is going to be the MVP because okay. I think he's going to have one huge play um, probably a couple touchdowns in this one. So I have him clearing a hundred yards and getting a couple touchdowns in this game to win the MVP. 
Uh, Matt Stafford plays well, but uh, Cooper Cup ends up being the difference maker, I think, on a couple key third down catches or something like that to help them put the hammer down and, and the dagger for Cincinnati. So the but, only thing I, I think it'll be a good game. Yeah, the only thing I disagree with you is that I just think that the mindset of the teams will be different to start. You said you think they're going to come out and try to feel each other out, maybe establish the run. I feel as though this Bengals team is currently just – they play are playing with more house money than any other team that I can – in recent memory that, that is in a Super Bowl right now. And it's all uh, led by the fact that they have a young star quarterback with an all-star young wide receiver, and they want to make big plays. I think Sean. I just think the best way for them to do that early, though, is to establish the run. I I mean, I I tend to agree. They got to keep the Rams honest. I just think there's going to be. I I think there's going to be more scoring. That's where I think the higher points come in. And and part of that too is I I just have a a belief that McVay will look back at that ten to you know what was it? They ended up losing ten to three in that Super Bowl to the. The, the Patriots, I mean, I it think was it was like, like 13 to 13 to 10. It ended up being because yeah, they, something like that. They were just not never aggressive enough and they played so timid. And that's the reason they went out and got Matt Stafford. And I think they know the best thing they can do is to be aggressive, to put points up because that will force the Bengals to go away from Joe Mixon. It'll force the Bengals to put in a three wide, open up that offensive line to be attacked by Aaron Donald and stuff. So I, I I think there'll be aggressiveness early and it'll settle and then things will settle in a little bit more and, and the the teams will feel each other out. But I, I just feel like both Zach Taylor, Sean McVay are, are going to both try to script that first 15 plays is all co- offensive coaches do for their teams with some shots. And who knows, mm-hmm. that may lead to turnovers or that may lead to, to turn uh, to, to punts because they don't connect on them. Or I think in this case, it'll lead to one or two of them will lead to an extra field goal or an extra touchdown where maybe the conservative game plan wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't happen. But either way, I think we're both in, in agreement here that it's not going to be uh, one of those games where you're like boring. This, this kind of stinks and, you know, drive home safely Bengals drive home safely Rams, you know, by the midway of the second quarter, Sure, a yeah. lot like that chiefs uh, Bengals, you know, game kind of started, and, you know, by midway through the second quarter, we were like, all right, pencil the Chiefs in. They got this thing. It's just got to just get to another half. I think this game will feel closer for mo- the majority of the game. Yeah, and you, and you said Matt Stafford's your MVP, Cooper Cup mine. We both have the Rams winning. Yep. Um, it's just maybe in a different way. I could easily see it, though, uh, as you said. I could see it being a high-scoring game as well. This game could go a lot of different ways in my view. Um, and, you know, we'll just kind of – we'll have to see – uh, who was right in terms of how maybe things are going to unfold from the first to the second half. So, so we'll have to wait and see on that. I, I'll, I'll give my take on it. I'll have, I'll ask you first real quickly as you're wrapping up the show. We both think the Rams will win. What will happen in your mind for the Bengals to win? If we're in a week from now talking about the Simpsons uh, Bengals, the Super Bowl champions, what goes, what goes in their favor? What goes wrong? How does the game play out for the Bengals to win? Uh, I think the for the Bengals to win, they have to win the turnover margin by at least two. I agree. And, and I think, um, I think they're going to have to have a huge, a 70 yard play, a 60 yard play, something like that, that, that really, you know, um, maybe shocks the Rams a little bit and, and gets them a little bit uneasy and then having to account for the big play. And then that's going to open up other things. So I think, uh, the combination of winning the turnover margin by multiple and, uh, and by getting a, a huge play in there at some point. I couldn't agree more. A- a- absolutely. The Bengals win this game if Stafford has multiple interceptions or an interception and a running back has a fumble like we've seen in the recent uh, times for, for the Rams. Uh, but then also, I think it's, I, I think it's a, a, a combination of Joe Mixon breaking a big run and then Joe Burrow having close to 400 yards and Jamar Chase going for 150 and two tutties. I think you're going to need those three guys to have incredible days coupled with the Rams come out tight and they turn the ball over early and just can never Mm -hmm. get into the rhythm that they want to get into. Definitely. Yep. Absolutely. I think we're, we're in agreement there for sure. So can't wait, man. Oh, we finally got to our Super Bowl. Uh, So obviously next week we will have our Super Bowl recap for you all. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, definitely give us your thoughts online. You know, what, what you think are some of the good prop bets or what your just a general prediction is for this Super Bowl. But nonetheless, as always, we hope you all enjoy the game. Uh, have fun with your friends, family, get those Super Bowl spreads going. Uh, should be a great uh, weekend of football. Once again, uh, best game of the year. And, uh, and we'll have a lot to talk about next week as we uh, launch ourselves then into the off season, looking at the draft, free agency, all that stuff. Uh, be sure to stay tuned. Again, always hit, hit us up on uh, Twitter at Dan Vasco, at Mark Hespin, at FB Lounge Pod. But until next week, have a great week and a great Super Bowl party.